popcorn where I start to discuss. Want to know some more fun facts? Isn't it awesome to see some of your favorite content creators and favorite people, honestly, if you follow here on this app, be a part of this amazing community called The Nerd Initiative. Fantastic. Well, it's, it is, again, it's really good to meet you. Um, and I'm excited to chat about this because <clears throat> I, I will admit like as a, a football novice, um, this kind of really was one of the first projects that kind of got me interested. Um, so hats wow. off to you, my friend, <laughs> like it was, it's really well Great. done. Um, and so I, to kick it off, like, I'd love to know how this, this particular project developed or came together. I know you've covered football in the past, clearly uh to escobars and there's so many others how did this project come together for you i mean it, it was one of the biggest sports headlines that i could remember ever when when the story broke um you know it was shocking it was a, a coup d'etat attempt on the highest offices of power in the side the world's biggest sports industry and it was clear that it was going to affect uh you know industry and economics and politics well outside of sport um, so I was, first of all, gripped by the uh, play by play as it unfolded for that reason. And secondly, it's just never so rare that you ever get to see under the hood and look at the way the machinery works um, when you're talking about industry and power and money at this level. Uh, so it, it really felt like an opportunity. Um, Connor Shell from 30 for 30, who I did a bunch of stuff for in the past, is a co-executive producer on this, and Libby Geist, who also ran 30 for 30 at ESPN. Um, they have great relationships in the sports world. And within a few weeks, the three of us were on calls with uh, the decision makers on all sides of the story. And uh, it looked like we would be able to share their not only their arguments but also their personal experiences going through this and and that felt like okay we've got something here like not only is it you know good suspense got a lot of genre elements it feels like a political thriller it's unfolding with this tick tock real time countdown but also we're going to have a chance at humanizing and dimensionalizing these people that usually are just hanging out in the high towers facelessly making decisions behind closed doors um and and you know make them accessible in ways that fans can identify with you're talking about betrayal and alliances and you know shifting allegiance and and secret plotting and hacks and leaks and so it had all the elements of a, of a big story um that you know was about something else something bigger bigger questions about culture who owns culture who gets to say um you know I, I think the ultimately there's questions about the morality um, and code of conduct in the in the business space. Like, do we hold ourselves to a high enough standard of morality in business? Should we hold ourselves to the same standards um, of conduct in business as we do in our friendships and and in our families? Um, so there were bigger, more universal thematic questions at stake here, and this is a, just a great lens, a great container to explore that stuff. Yeah, you covered. Wow. You covered a, a lot <laughs> in a little bit. I, I appreciate that, too. Um, one thing I do want to, you know, piggyback off of you mentioned, obviously, you know, the code of conduct and what's going on. And you do cover the disenfranchised pretty often and you do it so well um, through multiple lenses. Uh, you know, here, like UEFA feels like one of the last, if not the last major sports where you can work your way up, which is Super interesting. And I, I loved learning about all of that as I was watching. Um, is that such a crucial part of your storytelling to kind of really focus on not only multiple angles, but the disenfranchise and tell the stories that usually don't get told? Um, if, if not, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's giving too much credit here to say <laughs> that this is a story that doesn't get told because the fans version of how football has been hijacked right the way that they sort of going back to the roots of the working class roots of the game the people's game um you know on shipyards and coal mining um and what clubs meant for their local identity like they are telling that story constantly now whether or not that's getting picked up uh whether or not that's getting propagated whole other question but when it came to the super league that became the narrative that was the dominant mainstream telling of this story um was that the fans took to the streets and they won 
And, you know, we complicate that in the series. Uh, you know, I, I am, I'm hopeful personally that football doesn't move entirely in the direction of uh, private interests and um, becoming just strictly an entertainment business. I really hope that the voice of uh, the fan is helping to inform and write the future of the sport. But there are parts of me that are cynical that 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 was really all that was at play here. And uh, I think, you know, particularly in the later episodes, we do ask those difficult questions about um, whether or not there was opportunism, whether or not um, those those fan voices that were that were sort of highlighted as so influential here, whether that's going to sustain itself or whether that just happened because it worked really well for some other people's agendas. Um, so, uh, you know, ultimately, this is, I think, less about um, telling a disenfranchised story that doesn't have a light shown on it enough and more an exploration of um, this identity crisis that the sport is in. And I think that's a, that's a mirror of an identity crisis that we're in as a society. You know, we, we, we want to sort of cling on to this ideal of the social democracy, the, the mythology of, you know, the people's game. Um, but we also totally acknowledge reluctantly um, that, the, that we're inevitably in a entertainment business and that it's going to be driven by market forces. So, you know, that tug of war, the, the bashing together of those two forces, um, it's rare that you get to explore that, like the overlaps here. I mean, I, the, one of the things I found fascinating from the onset was you've got Middle Eastern sheikhs, Russian oligarchs, uh, Asian tycoons of business, a hedge fund billionaires from the United States, presidents, prime ministers, the royal family, fans taking to the street, like, where do you get all of those stakeholders that riled up and invested? And, and that just felt like a, an incredible opportunity. Parenthetically, yes, I think a big part of my body of work is about disenfranchised stories. <laughs> I don't know that this is the one. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what struck me, though, um, from what you just said, obviously, it is I was nodding my head and I don't do that. Like, just, you know, I know I, people think you do it just because. I it's hard not to be cynical, you know, the chasm in not just football, but in other sports, but also just like you said, society, you said, I could not agree more because it just seems to get wider and wider. And it is really hard not to be cynical these days. And so I, I do think things like UEFA and things like that, like, should be held with kitten gloves, because it's just it's. It, it, yeah, it, it, it's just hard not to kind of like. To, to have that feeling um, in your everyday life. It's tough. Yeah. And the fans themselves, they voice that in episode four, that, you know, while they want to celebrate this victory and leverage it to have more of a say going forward, they also are realistic about, you know, how the agendas and forces aligned in a particular moment in time and that they are not sure that that's going to uh, be the, the, the way it's going to, unfold in the future. Um, I'm not sure, having lived in this space for a year and a half, that there is um, clear, honest communication between these very disparate uh, stakeholder groups. It does feel more like, um, given the crisis of the moment, what alliances make the most sense. Mm -hmm. And um, that I recognize the cynicism of that. So I also, you know, think it's important to say, God damn, how refreshing that people taking to the streets and protest actually move the needle. That's amazing. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't happen anymore. We should be celebrating that. Yeah. I mean, I was going to, I was going to ask the rhetorical question of what you think if this could happen again, because obviously there have been reports and, and whatever, but you kind of already answered that or you're like, I don't know. Um, well, so, everybody, you know. everybody we interviewed, even those that are so wholeheartedly on the side of tradition and meritocracy and the pyramid and the fans everybody feels that there's another crisis on the horizon, um, that the issues that led to the European Super League effort in 2021 have not been resolved. Uh, and, you know, the, the metaphor that Anas Lagrari uses in the series is that the, the foundation on which the football edifice is built is, is 
fissured, it's cracked, it's flawed. And so we can't expect the building to stay erect. You know, they, they talk about this house of cards collapsing and that's what the Super League argument is, is we have to look ahead. We have to get ahead of this before the whole bubble bursts. And, um, and that may be uncomfortable, but change is always uncomfortable. If you don't innovate, if you don't look to the future, then we're all gonna lose out. Um, now, you know, there's plenty of ways to poke holes in that and say that that's an agenda-based argument. But it's also something that you could apply to past examples, like the, the Premier League um, in England in the 1990s was extremely unpopular. It was a breakaway league. It changed the way that football is broadcast, the way football business is done. Um, and now it's a national treasure. So, you know, innovation uh, in the past in football has not always been met with open arms and has eventually sometimes, like in the case of the Premier League, been embraced. Um, and that's a good example that the Super League points to. And they have a bunch of other arguments as well that we try to be as persuasive as we can in arguing in the series. That's awesome.